tell you something, that when you've been faithful to God and you've proved yourself to God that you want to live for him each and every day, God most definitely will give you what's deemed necessary as it pertains this to conference will now be recorded in the things of Jesus Christ. We greet you in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. For him we live, we move, and we have our being. I thank and praise the Lord for all of you that have most definitely have attentively just waited um, for me to share part five of this most definitely powerful series. I've enjoyed teaching it because I live by these principles. And I can truly say that it's God most definitely that it's working through me and in me. And without him, there is no resolve or what I'll call resolution or anything outside of what I'll call things that may seem to be impossible. God is a good God. Because he's good, we most definitely give him obeisance, not only through our mouths, but through our lives. And I tell you, a lot of times we always about praise and worship. It should be worship and praise. Because as I worship God with my lifestyle, I'm able most definitely, most definitely to give him most definitely a praise because of our worship him throughout the week. And yes, we want to most definitely be a chaste version of the Lord. But the Bible said he's coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. Please understand, it doesn't mean that saints are not flawed, but the overall design of God's body is perfect. And therefore, amen, none of us have any excuse of showing that it's failure in God. The failure lies in us, our desires and our intentions. And because of this, we must understand that Jesus Christ sits on the throne. He looks down and he also considers our ways. And therefore, he said, I'm a God that will never leave you nor forsake you. And when we know that and we walk in it, we're going to consider it with a pure heart. And we most definitely know that God is doing this work in our lives. Then only then can we most definitely thank God for who he is in our lives. God bless you. Father, right in the name of you, we thank you, O Lord. We want you to, God, Lord, to touch our minds. Download into us, Lord. Allow our tongue to be as a ready writer. I'm praying, Lord, that you allow us, Lord, to speak with articulation. Lord, as we try to, God, Lord, to render your word to the masses, to the saints, to those, Lord, who's inquiring about your greatness and your goodness. We forever give the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Amen. Um, we'll do that. And then let me put up my, and if there's any complication, Jazz, please text me. And let me know. I know what I did wrong last week. <laughs> uh, I call it what I call brain fog. Do I get an amen? It can happen. Amen. Especially as you get a little older. But I'm glad. Amen. We do those things that are deemed necessary to keep us somewhat on top of our game by mostly definitely doing things, continually, continuous reading and building up the muscles of our mind as we most definitely do not try to do away with stress. Amen. So, amen. We're just going to do a preview of um, last week. And as we most definitely deals with the topic, part five of Amen. Um, there is most definitely only, there's only one, Amen. And because of what we know God is doing in our lives, we're able, I reiterate, we're able to most definitely overcome everything that comes against us in these last and evil days. I'll tell anybody, and I mean this with all my heart, is of the lowest mercy that we most definitely are not consumed. And because of that, we know that whatever we go through, amen, that but we know what the way of escape, it has to be only through Jesus. Tell somebody, I've already looked and examined all the emergency exits, and each one of them are named Jesus Christ. So understand something. Here's why. Understand. The devil is using three points like I talked about it, and therefore these things are not to be what I consider misunderstood. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we understand this Adam relinquished a lot of things back unto what I call, not back, but just gave it to Satan by disobeying God. But we do understand because of what God is doing and God has done. Amen. Thank God for the last Adam that most definitely has given us the opportunity to be reconciled back to him. But the devil uses three points, and we talked about it real fast. We talked about the lust of the flesh when he came to in the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, verses one through four, and said, turn these stones that you have to bread. He came also and approached him, verses 5 through 7, and said, the pride of life, in which he tried to tempt, amen, God again, which was Jesus in the flesh. And verses 8 through 10, that same chapter, he came forth with the lust of the eyes. If he arrayed him with all the power and all what I consider being elevated in the world, as far as the kingdom of the world, was the lust of the eyes. Understand, 
what did Jesus do? As I fortunate last week, he refused the bait. Tell somebody if Jesus refused the bait, then you know we most definitely have to refuse the bait also. Does not mean that the bait will not be there. To say back and say that these things, well, did not Jesus say, lead us not into temptation? What the bottom line is, he was talking concerning the earnest of our heart. And therefore, we cannot be led into temptation unless, amen, those things have been afforded us based on the season that we're in. No man is tempted, amen, of God. When, when every man is tempted, he most definitely is tempted when he's most drawn from his own sin and enticed. This already is manifested in the flesh and basically um, is stirred up by the adversary because he knows what's in you as it pertains to your, excuse me, your desires. So understand this. Jesus is our ultimate example. This is where we most definitely want to start today. Jesus is our ultimate example. Well, why do you say that, Bishop Falk? The word of God says this. For the, this you were called, because Jesus Christ also suffered for us. Well, why? Leaving us an example. Now understand, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. He was both the son of man, but he was also, amen, God in the sonship. And because of that, it was imperative that Jesus come down and wrap himself in the flesh, most definitely, and walk among men. Jesus felt what we felt. Jesus, amen, cried like we cried. Jesus hungered like we hungered. Jesus felt heat. Jesus felt cold. All the things that man felt, amen, Jesus felt. But yet he himself was without sin. Why? Because Jesus had a dual nature. Amen. He was all God and he was all flesh. Well, you said, Pastor Falk, how could that be? Well, the Bible lets us know that Jesus Christ, most definitely, was the image. Amen. And the express image of God and his glory. Amen. The Bible says that Adam was made in God's image. Jesus Christ was not made. He'd already existed. Amen. For he was most begotten of the Father. And because of these things, he was able to overshare Mary um, with the Holy Spirit and impregnate her with his spirit, and which most definitely allowed the word of God to become flesh. Do you follow what I'm saying? What word of God? The same God that said, let there be light. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so when we think about how powerful and how awesome God is, there is no way in the world that we can sit back and mis mis misconstrue um, what I consider doubt when it comes to knowing that God most definitely will walk out what he promised. Understand who committed no sin, nor was deceit or guile many found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile again. Amen. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. I've always made it very clear. You will never notice. I mean, excuse me. You will notice. Help me, Holy Ghost. You will notice in everything recorded in Jesus when he was on the earth. Jesus never called God um, 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 Lord. He always called God Father. Always called him Father. And that's what the Bible says. Amen. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And therefore we see because of these things, Jesus Christ most definitely, as he most definitely prayed to his father, he let it be known that it was all based on the relationship that he already had before the foundation of the world or creation itself, because he himself was the author of creation. Well, how do we know that? When we go, amen, to the book of Colossians, it lets us know very, very clearly that all things were must have been created by him and through him and by him does all things um, exist. It basically talks about his preeminence. So therefore, if I'm serving Jesus Christ who is preeminent, we understand that his judgments have to be righteous on a perpetual basis. Glory be to God. Well, because of this, because he was the example that Peter most definitely spoke of so diligently, we see that we must resist also like Jesus resisted. On one occasion, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. When you're not resisting the devil, you're resisting your own flesh. And I'm telling you right now, we know Satan is our, is our enemy because he's an adversary to God. But understand, my greatest enemy is me, myself, and I. And I'm telling you that when the devil or his demons do not give me a personal um, visitation, my flesh most deaf is with me 24-7. And it's imperative that I'm cognizant of the fact 
that I most definitely must mortify the deeds thereof. And Paul said, reckon it dead. Every day when it tries to rise up, I got to most definitely know that the fight within, and I've convinced myself through the power of the Holy Ghost, based on his leading, amen, and this flesh is dead. Amen? Because I'm now a new creation in Christ Jesus. How? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Know what he says. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, wait a minute, what? The devil. Now understand, your adversary, what? Adversary means Satan. Then they go from there says the devil. Now I have an adversary, which is Satan, who is the devil, who always is trying to find a reason, amen, to accuse me before God. Walks about like a roaring lion. You know that the Bible says in the book of Job, that when the sons of God came together to worship God, God asked, um, Satan said, what you doing here? I, I say, he said, I go to and fro in the earth, basically, roaming. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the air. And therefore, Satan is the little G, God of this worldly system. So he's not in the subterranean. Satan and his kingdom of darkness is in the air, seeking whom he may devour. So that means that he's not omnipresent. Satan always have to stay on the move. Why? Because it's his job to try to find somebody and take them out. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced, okay, by your own brothers in this world. And so Peter's letting you know that in these last days, individuals will faint, I guess, because they just don't realize what the end times is to bring upon us. But aren't you glad, amen, like the Bible Paul said, that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices? And if I am ignorant of the devil's devices, it is imperative that I most definitely become cognizant of my lack thereof. And if I understand that I'm lacking something, I look crazy not trying to improve in those areas that I'm lacking. I find myself on a perpetual basis, always, whether I'm picking up a book, or I'm reading something directly off the Bible, I'm always striving, striving to make sure that I'm growing in Christ Jesus. I may not be going through um, a particular thing in the season of my life. Does not mean it's not going to happen two months down the road. But the thing is, while I'm building myself up in my most holy faith, I'm building myself up for future endeavors, future tests and trials, future victories. Why? Because I most definitely have prepared for such things. Now understand something, since I am in the fifth chapter of First Peter, I can speak this because me being the under shepherd um, of mountaintop, okay, um, designated by God, I thought about this also concerning the shepherds of the flock of God. So I, let me speak something that most definitely relates to me personally. If we go to First Peter chapter number five, verse one, the scripture says what I say um, explicitly and says, the elders which are among you I exalt, exhort. Well, I'm also an elder, meaning also me, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Ah, the Lord gave me a message um, for Sunday, for Resurrection Sunday, and I'm going to deal with two words. Amen. Great is the mystery of godliness. And I'm going to focus on mystery and godliness. I'll leave it at that. And I'm sure, hopefully, God will give you an understanding of what I'm talking about. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Meaning the what? you got to be in position. And not only just an elder, but anyone who's been given a, a position in leadership as it pertains to serving God. But more so, not as much as the pastor. Because the pastor is held accountable, Lord have mercy, for watching the sheep. Oh, glory. Take it over, not by constraint, but willingly. Uh, you ever seen some preachers, most definitely, who most definitely are not in the mindset? And what the Bible says that a man that desires um, the office of a bishop, basically meaning um, the office of a pastor, um, he himself must be given the hospitality. What does that mean? He must love God's people. You can't just be in love, in love with the position and not love his sheep. 
does not mean that they will not most definitely cause burden to be upon you. But that's when God gives you pastoral grace to one where you're able, amen, to understand, amen, the way of escape. And so therefore, any leader will learn as he leads that he continuously and perpetually have to most definitely escape into Jesus Christ, who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre. Oh, Lord, can you imagine Pastor Falk was just passing just for money? Well, if that's the case, I probably wouldn't be around. <laughs> Do I get an amen? Don't get me wrong. We must definitely be fervent in business, all right? What I'm saying is in our administrative stance and what we must do concerning uh, making sure the church is running adequately, the bills are paid, all right, things as such, well, when we come to worship, you don't have to worry about those things. But all those things most definitely are required. Paul said, gave you an example of all the things he went through. Then he said, not including the daily administration I have for all the churches, most definitely that I'm accounted for. But again, who much is given, much is required. But of a ready mind. Ah, well, you can do a ready mind when you most definitely have allowed Jesus Christ to be the anchor in your life. Mm, glory be to God. The way of escape. Mm, Jesus Christ. Uh, hide me in thy provision, O Lord. Glory. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. El Elian shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty God. El Shaddai. Aren't you glad you know him today as Jesus? And all those names that was rendered in the past that pointed to his coming and the ultimate name that you can call on that name when things seem to be so dismal? Aren't you glad about it? Neither as being lords over God's heritage. That's right, I'm not your king. Jesus is your king. I'm not your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. But I am the one that God most definitely is saw fit to allow myself to be an under shepherd. It doesn't matter. I may have found mountaintop, but Jesus Christ is the essence of mountaintop. But being an example to the flock, uh, just imagine if I always walked around pray, all we down in my spirit. That is not told you and read to you in the eighth verse where it says, "Be sober, be vigilant." Why? Because the devil is there. Most of the change your countenance. One occasion, the psalm says, "So, so, why art thou cast down? Hope thou in God." Hence, if I have to hope thou in God, that means that I must also put my entire trust in a lively hope, something greater than me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, who is he? It's not it. It's the Holy Ghost. That Jesus Christ talked about so emphatically in the 16th chapter of the book or gospel of St. John. Neither be lords over God's heritage, but be an example to the flocks. Now, here it is. And when the chief shepherd, aren't you glad that God lets you know right now, just through that, I'm the under shepherd. When the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And then it goes through talking about protocol. A lot of people do not respect the older saints. All right. So understand, prior to pastors um, and some of the churches were established, you had elders in the church, which were seasoned saints, until, amen, they were able to put pastors, or what I'll call under shepherds, over those flocks. Likewise, young, submit yourself to the elder, yea, and all you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. But what is humility? Ah, that means that we're not walking around being condescending. I don't feel I'm any better than you are. I don't care how many degrees you have, or I have, and what have you. I don't care most definitely if you win every day, every Sunday, what I call the highest of designer clothes and somebody most definitely are wearing cheaper brands. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And therefore we are not to exalt ourselves among or above one another. When we exalt, we exalt God. And as we exalt God, God will most definitely allow us to be elevated in him. And be clothed with humility for God, resist the pride I told you, and give of grace to the humble. Now, I love five and six. Amen. Humble yourself. First thing he tells you, uh, the bit of the day, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and that he may exalt you in due time. If you believe that, you don't worry about somebody trying to take your spot. 
You don't have to worry about it in regards. Somebody most definitely going to get something before you get it. That is human experience. And God showed us that through James and John. Amen. Which are known as the sons of thunder. And their mother, which they considered the sons of Zebedee, their mother requested Jesus, Lord, will you grant my sons? Amen. They sit on the right hand, right side, right, have the right hand of your kingdom. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not to give. And so we find out that God did bless our sons. Amen. But James, the Bible did not give him what I consider a deep, deep um, expository as it pertains to um, his life. You don't hear anything from the bibliography concerning um, I'm James. You do understand when you read the book of Acts, the Bible said, and James was murdered. James was killed. And that was it. But we see his brother John was the one, only the apostle that was not murdered. And he lived a full natural life. And he died of what I'll call um, natural, what I'll consider things. Amen? Glory. Casting all your cares upon him. Why? Well, because he feels what you feel. Well, he felt what you felt. For he cared for you. And therefore, I'm going to reiterate the eighth verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk of about, seeking whom he may devour. He said, now, you knowing this, he said, I need you now, what, to resist. Not only just for one day, but while you're resisting him, you cannot move off your position. You have to resist steadfast. In the faith. And that's why it's imperative that each and one of us most definitely are rooted and grounded in the word of God. I didn't say that you had to be what I call an Einstein in this Bible. But you most definitely must give due diligence and earnest to try to study. As you study God's word, God will unfold things um, to you. And I'm telling you, the greatest revelation, or should I say revelation, the greatest illumination that you receive in studying God's word is when the word of life becomes alive in you. Ooh, you're talking about being the right divided it then. It's no greater feeling than being able to walk out the word. Here it is, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brother that are in the world. To birth, but the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while. Wait a minute, Pastor Falk. You mean to tell me I got to suffer? Well, do. As the old times used to say that in, in, down, in down south. Well, do. Well, you sure do have to suffer a while. After you have gone through, after you have dealt with the season in which God has allotted for you to deal with. Oh, and while you're in that season, you're more than ever convinced that you have to most definitely um, make a way or run to the way of escape, which is Jesus Christ. Because when you look around, you realize. To whom shall we go? For you alone, Lord, have the words of eternal life. And that you have suffered a while, make you, notice, he make you perfect, make you mature. And when you become mature, what happens? You become more balanced in God. And if you become more balanced in God, he's able to establish you in some areas of your life, amen, that you had not experienced before. And once I'm established in God and remain established in God, I most definitely seem to walk with a, a certain type of strength, means I'm strengthened. And therefore, when I'm strength, I'm settled in God. And when you most definitely are settled in God, like Peter said, whom resists steadfast in the ninth verse. And we most definitely are steadfast in God. We understand. That's why in the faith, meaning the doctrine, the teachings, that's why Jews said that we are said to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Let me tell you something. You're talking about, well, God's doing a new thing. God most definitely may be doing new things based in regards to different seasons. But let me tell you something. The platform or the basis does not change. And people are trying to most definitely modify the foundational things that we know has built it up through not only his apostles, but also our forefathers, most of who took heed to the same doctrine that has been handed down. Tell somebody and type in, I'm not selling out, Pastor. Well, thank the Lord, because many people are selling out. Amen? Christ used the way of escape. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Falk? Here it is. Oh, I love it. Oh, I told you. No temptation 
Somebody so no temptation. No temptation have taken you, but such is common to man. Well, Bishop, well, if, if you're saying that and I'm going through what I'm going through, then we got to understand that God most definitely gets all the glory out of our lives. And therefore, if we understand these things, we cannot walk around mumbling all the time. Why? Because we already sat back and said that Jesus Christ has been our example and is our example. God also gave us an example of the children of Israel through their mumbling and the like thereof of faith in believing the established word that God had handed to them through um, the prophet Moses. We see it was their demise. And through it all was going on, God told us to stand still. Just stand on my word. Just do what I told you. Amen. And so when you see these things, you see this particular scripture in which God, Paul, gives warning as it pertains to um, these individuals because they were so impatient. They become idolatrous. It was meaning that they most definitely began to worship the world. See, the world most definitely will give you instant gratification for something. Why? Because instant gratification gives you an opportunity to escape to something. Oh, uh, do I get an amen? A lot of times we don't want to wait on God. We want a quick fix. That's why you see individuals that pair themselves up with another individual that has not been ordained by God. Okay? And they will say it's God. That's why the Bible says to say, and emphatically, that it says, be not e unequally yoked with unbelievers or non-believers. And don't get me wrong, because somebody say they say, because somebody sit back and say they embrace your doctrine, don't mean they do it. And I'm telling folks in a minute, we can convince ourselves all we want because of the season we're in. But a true saint, a true saint will know if I just stand still, okay? And a dodge you can just mean just serving myself. Sometimes I can get so frustrated, you get so much frustrated, I just want something for me. And a lot of things we want, don't you think that God wants something for you more than you want for yourself? And therefore, that's what about, it's not in us to choose our own path. Why? Because God is the only one that's omniscient and he most definitely can see the future because he is God. Do you follow what I'm saying? So these things right now has been most definitely designated to be put forth that we may be able to see who we are in God based on what we go through. And that's why on this slide, we see in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, it says, there have, oh Lord. But before we even read that scripture, let me understand and understand what I'm trying to tell you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 and start at the 11th verse. Notice, now all these things happen to them for an example. Who is he talking about in that, this chapter? Israel. All they, every time something go right, the attitude shifted back to the ideologies of Egypt. How in the world can I, who was most definitely um, locked into the breakly elements of bondage and sin, have the audacity to sit back and say, it's the best thing that will work for me now? Because if it did, then why did I look for a way of escape? Knowing that the world could not offer me nothing but death and destruction and demise. And I knew even when I got saved, if I continued the path I was going out, that I was the worst person in the world, but I realized I was, my life was going a vicious cycle, okay? And because of that, I realized that I needed something that was greater than me. And I've exhausted all of what I consider the human philosophies that I tried to believe was right. I needed real truth. And thank God, on January the 17th, 1980, God filled me with the Holy Spirit, and I've been able to walk after him as he most definitely guides me into the absoluteness of truth each and every day. So it says this, now these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our, what? And my ammunition, right? Ammunition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand him, take heed lest he fall. I like that scripture. A lot of times we feel because things are going well in the season that we're in, that we can stop providing the earnest to seek God's face on a perpetual basis. The same thing that got you here, the same thing's going to keep you here. The same thing, most definitely, when you first started the babe of Christ, you used to love to pray, love Bible class. Come on, love the fellowship of the saints. 
Love to be in church as much as possible. Love to serve in the church. Well, those things still remain, okay? And I find that when individuals allow the world to entertain them more than the things that are required by God, they become more than desensitized in the Holy Spirit. And when one becomes desensitized to the things of the Holy Spirit, you most definitely will take the wrong perspective. All of a sudden, um, your vision seems to be torn. Just your vision seems to be off, all right? You become what I'll call nearsighted and farsighted, meaning that you can't see the things you need to see based on the time you're supposed to see it. Wherefore, let him that think he stand, take heed lest he fall. Then the scripture says here, there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Notice this, here we go again. He's faithful. You think God's gonna allow you to be in a trial, even though he's observing you and know that he's purging you in it, that he's not gonna give you strength to be sustained while you're going through what you're going through? There it is. Who will not suffer you, meaning he will not permit you to be tempted above that which you are able. Come on. The Bible let us know you think that God, when the Hebrew boys went in, the greatest thing that God got happy when the boys sat back and said, well, young men say, look at King Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you concerning this matter. Bottom line is, we don't have to take second thought, third thought, fourth thought. You know our position. You know all things, how we're going to stand. You know we're going to be steadfast in the things concerning the doctrine or the teachings who've been handed down through our fathers. We will not bow down to your image. But the Bible let us know that we're only to worship God and him only. So we understand that because he got real upset. The Bible says he had the audacity to turn up the furnace. All right. I can turn up because they didn't have what I call electrical knobs, meaning that he most definitely made the heat seven times um, higher than what it was. And whether he put in ambers or coals or mo oak, oak wood, whatever it is, whatever it took, he most definitely made that furnace hotter than normal. It had to be because understand if the ones that were throwing them in was consumed, as soon as they opened the door, it let you know that was like what I'll call a very hot inferno. In regards of how it seems like we're going into what I'll call um, the inferno of what I consider the files of our tribulations and trials, the Bible lets us know that he's in there with us. And God proved that when Nebuchadnezzar said he looked in and he said, you threw in three, three. Below, I see four, and he looks like the son of God. Oh, let me stop here. What do you mean? God himself didn't take them out the fire. He got right there in the fire with them. What you mean? You mean to tell me that when they man the way of escape, sometimes the exit, sometimes the exit comes right to you. You have ever had a situation of testing trials that you're going through? He told you, don't move. Just stand still. I'm going to come like where were you at so that you can see the salvation I'm about to provide for you in this situation. Somebody ought to get happy because I'm about to get happy all over again. Notice, but with the same temptation or with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able, what? To bear. Wherefore, my beloved beloved, flee from idolatry. Don't allow yourself to be consumed with yourself or others because others cannot give you the escape that you need. I don't care how much you call them on the phone. I don't care how much you cry on their shoulder. It comes a time that the Bible says, let every man, every woman bear his own burden. And therefore, when I bear my own burden, then I most definitely position myself for Jesus Christ to be my burden bearer. Oh, glory be to God. Aren't you happy that you know him in the full essence of his glory? What did Jesus do? He refused the bait. And because he refused the bait, he was able, amen, to stand and not be tempted. He allowed whatever temptation that came his way, he stood on the word of God. And every time Satan came to him with various things in that fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, he reiterated three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. Leave here, Satan. Way of escape number one, let's list them out here. Let's give a little sequential here. Follow the examples. Glory be to God, set by Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor Falk, what are you getting ready to do? I'm getting ready to give you some more scriptures. Man, he sure uses a lot of scriptures. 
You better believe it. I look crazy up here on TV and online while we're down streaming, just giving you a speech. No, we come to teach Bible class. And you can't teach Bible class unless you have what I would call sufficient biblical references. Let's go where it says here. Ah, uh, understand this. This is Jesus. Way of escape number one. First Peter 2, 21. For even in two were ye called, because Jesus Christ also suffered us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps. Notice, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. What you mean? When he was on that cross, he could have called down legions of angels because he was God, but he had to complete the task. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Why he knew there was only one meter between God and man. He realized that it was only that he represented the full what I call um, propitiation. He was the only one who could appease God, meaning he himself could only appease himself. Ooh, Lord. Here it is. Who his own self bear our sins. Did you hear that? Who his own self bear our sins. Where? In his body, I told you, on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. That's why Paul said, reckon yourself dead. By whose stripes ye were healed. Isn't that powerful? Because that's the same thing. Amen. The eagle eye prophet, Haradabhoshata, he spoke unto us and let it be known. He was pointing to Jesus. Well, I'm so glad Jesus most definitely didn't just lay on that cross. Somebody said he got up. Amen. That he most definitely could finish the course. Lord, what did Isaiah say in Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, if I may read it in your hearing? Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Don't you know when Jesus, when Jesus Christ laid on that particular, on that cross, the Bible says, amen. God could not look on him when sin was about to come on his body. And understand, Jesus and God, most definitely who were the same, but Jesus Christ was God in the sonship, had never been separated. Uh, go ahead, but for that particular time, because there ain't no sin, most definitely come on God, because God most definitely will not come in contact with sin, but bind himself to come in the form of lemon, fruit, and flesh, who knew no sin. Glory. He says what? But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. What you mean? All the things that we deserve. That's why we call it the efficacious work. Oh, excuse me. The vicarious suffering. Vicarious meaning that someone suffered as a substitute for you and I. Notice. The chest fire of peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Healed from what? From what I call the penalty of sin. Ah, that's not now. We can come boldly to the throne that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. What it says here, all we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord have laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah also said he looked around and tried to find a man. He could not find one. So what happened? The Bible said he brought salvation with his own arm. Aren't you glad today for the last Adam? Aren't you glad for what Jesus Christ has done for you and I? Amen. And because of these things, we ought to give God what I consider Glory and praise as we most of to render him obeisance because he's more than worthy for the things he's afforded us. Let's go to First Peter 4 and 1 reads as follow. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, um, yourself likewise, the same mind. Whatever I got to do to go through, Lord, because you've given me the paraclete. You've given me the advocate. You've given me the Holy Ghost to endure, to encourage me, to give me strength. Arm yourself like one with the same mind. For he that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. Second verse, 1 Peter 4 and 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh 
to the lust of men, but to the will of God. It's a fight. It's a fight for you. It's a fight for me. But we learn how to render this over to God. I'm telling you, every day I get up these 17 works of the flesh, they're still in it. I'm telling you, this flesh is contaminated. But thank God, God most definitely um, has given us what I call a renewing of a new mind. Because greater is he that's in us and he's in the world. And now I have the new man. Come on. Not the old man that I'm being led by. We thank God for the regenerated Donnie. Because the unregenerated Donnie was something else. And I'm here to let you know that his ways will always try to come out every day because it's a part of your natural man's DNA. But thank God for the new man. Here it is, that he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh to lust a man with the will of God. Notice this, for the time past, our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banqueting, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye, notice this, that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot and speaking evil of you, meaning you don't do it anymore. And now they think it's strange. Now they think something wrong with you. But tell somebody, I found the way of escape, Jesus Christ. It wasn't in the bottle, it wasn't in the ganji, it wasn't in the pills. When in the porn, huh? Oh, let me stop. Who should give account to him that is ready to judge the quick? Who's the quick? Those have been made alive in Christ Jesus. And also the dead, the dead of those who rejected him. The Bible says, ye have he quickened. And what? And it's put you where? In heavenly, or us has he quickened. And it's put us where? In heavenly places. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Amen. Who were dead in trespassing sins, right? That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to what? God in the spirit. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Um, you didn't choose me. I chose you. The day you hear his voice, heart, not your heart. Think of all the billions of people to hear this gospel, but they will not receive it to the extent which shows that there's been a regeneration process that has taken place within them. That's why you got to walk out the gospel, that you may be able to acquire what God has promised you as it pertains to being associated and being filled with the new man. And once I have the new man, which has been empowered through the Holy Ghost, I must condition my natural mind to be governed, to be led by him and not by my old nature. Do I get an amen? Isn't that something? Seven verse, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. A man and woman should always pray that they may not faint. Let me tell you something. When you have a mindset to pray, God will help you in all the things that you go through. Amen? And I'm going to let you know that we're in the age right now, I've seen many people get the Holy Ghost. Many people get saved. But I can sit back and say, based on the facts of life as it pertains to being a part of the body of Christ, I've seen many people that have left the Lord because they would not embrace the oracles of God. They would not embrace the fundamental things to remain in God. Come on. We know also if you want to stay somewhat fit, don't get me wrong, things can still happen to you. But at least God will bless you for exemplifying um, discipline. We know we're no greater than what we allow ourselves to be disciplined in. If you're disciplined in God, then you most definitely will be able to acquire numerous victories in this walk. Why? Many people have left God. God gave them a chance. God filled them with the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in Jesus' name. God put them in a good God-fearing church or church that reverence God, sound doctrine, saints that love them. But guess what? They hungered for the world more than they hungered for God and his people. Well, how do we know that? Well, let's go to 1 John, the second chapter, verses 18 through 19. I'm giving you factual information here through scripture. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Understand, but understand. The spirit of the Antichrist is in the air. Why? Because the Antichrist is no more than Satan. Now, 
once we're raptured, he'll come most definitely in a human body. He'll take over an individual's mind, body, and being. And will operate through that individual. Because Satan can't be every place at one time. Notice, even now, there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time, meaning right now the last days. Here it is. Oh, God. They went out from us, but they were not of us. We got a whole lot of folks. Come on. They did not believe in holding on to the ultimate way of escape. They went out from us. They were saved. They were sanctified. What got them? False doctrine. What got them? Looking for a better way. What got them? Looking for another, what I consider, emergency exit to deal with life. But there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. For if they had been of us, oh, Lord, they would no doubt have continued what? With us. That's the book. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. You know, you, you ever seen people, when they see somebody leave, they be the first one to know why. But if anybody's spiritual, some individuals can sit back and discern some people's spirit. That's why I say, I've, and I'm not going to say I've never, but you, there's a such thing what I call spiritual bipolarism. And I've seen people that walk in depression because they have pulled forward themselves to get in that mindset because they have not diligently tried to feed their spiritual man. Stop doing what it entails to build yourself up in your most holy faith. You will be subject to what I consider these mindsets. I think two weeks ago, I woke up um, on one Saturday morning, like four in the morning, and I'm serious, it just, I can say it felt, I knew it was a personal attack from uh, the demons of darkness. And I'm telling you, I had to get up praying. I had to get up, I mean, I had to pray. Because my mind felt it was just so overly overwhelmed. I'm not saying to my how I felt. I'm telling you, I had to fight that day in the spirit. And so if I would allow myself to let, let the devil take my mind, it would have caused my day to be totally, totally wasted. But I decided to counteract those things. I just got, got in the Bible and started reading. Do you know, as I read God's word, I became more empowered. Why? Because the word of God is the full essence of truth when the devil is trying to come in your mind to dispel all truths that you know. Because sometimes situations may seem they don't change. And a lot of times we can get so disgruntled because we won't change, but change don't never seem to come. Come on. Come on. But God, let it be known all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus, you've got to go through. So first of all, you fool yourself thinking that you're going to walk through the tulips every day. No, God has called us, amen, to represent an example that we've been put before us in Jesus Christ. Then I read in Peter, even as he has suffered, who was Jesus Christ? And believe me, we have not even suffered like Jesus. No way, no how. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Know that what it says here. And they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But here it is. Somebody said the Holy Ghost. But ye have a holy but you have an unction from the Holy One. Who's the unction? The Holy Ghost. And ye know all things. How? Through discernment. If I'm sensitizing God, I will understand that and even if I have to go back and do a retreat to get myself together, I can escape to Jesus, that he may nurture me and build me up. What? I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. Here it is. Know not. Is also interpreted as genosco, meaning a narcissist, that you have not experienced the truth. You have enough experience in your walk. And some of you may be a babe, but one thing you most definitely can sit back and say, God must really love you because he went out his way to get you. That itself should be enough experience to let you know how special you are. And based on that, you build on that foundation. I have not written you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. Oh, God. Now you've experienced it, and because you've experienced it, now you've allowed it to come alive in you, and it's put your position to acquire more knowledge for future experiences. Mm. And that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denied that Jesus is Christ, 
He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Who have denied the Son, the same have, have not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son have what? The Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall can remain in you, ye shall, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Understand the preposition in. In means what? They're intertwined. They cannot be separated. Now, in regards to their position based on the set amount of time due season in which Jesus must have became to do what he had to do to reconcile us back. But Jesus Christ was God, but he was God in the sonship or the role of the son that he may reconcile us back unto what? Himself. Oh, glory be to God. And this is the promise that he had promised us, even eternal life. Somebody say it's worth it to have eternal life. Where? With him. Because it's going to be eternal life. It matters where you're going to spend and who you're going to spend it with. Right? And I sure don't want to be in the lake of fire with all those most definitely that have been considered damned through the judgment of Jesus Christ. Lord have mercy. These things I've written to you concerning them that seduce you. What? There's a seductive spirit out here. The devil is working through people to seduce you, to follow false doctrine, or to fall wham to your fleshy desires. Seduction is at the all-time peak. And you got to understand, you got to run to the way of escape. Oh, Lord. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, man. I, I got to keep reading this. 27 verse. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. What is the anointing? The Holy Ghost. And ye need not that any man teach you. Now, don't take that the wrong way. I'm teaching you now. It means as it pertains to being able to find direction, as it pertains to the gift of discernment. The Holy Ghost will talk to you. The Holy Ghost most definitely will ratify what truth is. It is most definitely the one that judges what truth is and what righteously is working in your life. Nobody got to teach you that. But it's the same anointing teaching you all things, and his truth, I told you, is no lie. And even as it have taught ye, ye shall do what? Abide in him. You got to abide in Jesus Christ in order to remain sensitized in the things of God. Here it is. We won't read all this, but if you go to Matthew 27, verses 11 through 43, the bottom line, don't be brought down to the tempter's level. I already told you in Ephesians 2 and 6 that he has put us in heavenly places, far above, amen, where the devil is as it pertains to our spiritual position or our rights. And we cannot be brought down unless we most definitely succumb to the wiles of the devil. Don't be brought down to the tempter's level. Why? Because God has elevated you and I way above that. But we have to most definitely embrace it and believe it with every aspect of our life to know that Jesus Christ is the true essence of our being. <clears throat> Here it is. He did not sin. He did not use guile. He did not revile back. But what you mean, Bishop? Jesus Christ finished the course. And when one finishes the course, then we understand that he was our ultimate example, right? He didn't do like Adam. The Bible says, and the woman gave unto him, and he did eat. The bottom line is, uh, the command was given to Adam, okay? Now, whether he wanted to be persuaded by the woman, that was his business, okay? God could not be blamed for that, because even God said, why did you listen to the woman? I gave you the command. You wanted to see. It had to be something, amen, that most definitely let you know um, that you were not ready for everything I had in store for you, Adam. And I'll tell people in a minute, you can walk around and tell them, oh, well, I don't want to miss nothing God got for me, all right? And I realize we don't serve God for brownie points. We don't. God is not that fickle because he's God. But I really believe that when one is being purged in God, the favor most definitely will overtake you. All right? But with favor comes more persecution. So when people sit back and say, I'm blessed and highly favored, it is me here. 
I'm blessed and I'm looking for the next test. <laughs> Glory be to God. So we go before and we read that particular chapter of Matthew 27. And around 11 verse, you will see how he was brought from court to court, how he stands before Pharaoh. Amen. How the crowd most definitely comes forth um, because he came into his own, his own received him not. They most definitely chose a thief and a murderer over Jesus Christ. They chose Barabbas. And Barabbas was a downright, what I call criminal. Jesus Christ was pure as snow. The Bible said there was no sin found in him. But yet they said, give us Barabbas. Isn't that something? And people most ever do it. And then we sit back when he did that and he goes, amen, um, Pilate, because he most definitely wanted to appease the people. The Bible says he washed his hand. He said, I find no fault in this man. This man is a just man. But because of how the structure was in the political arena, he wanted to make sure that he pleased the people. And therefore, he said, I wash my hands from this, but I'm going to do this because I understand within this province, I'm still here under the decree of Julius Caesar, or Caesar, that these things must be carried out as I service or render service to you and the Pharisees. So understand, he wasn't so much worried about what I call the masses as he was the leaders of the Jews. That being what I consider the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all those individuals that considered themselves leaders at that time of the nation of Israel under um, the authority of the Roman government. Amen? And so when we see these things, things go forth, and we see how they took it from judgment hall to judgment hall and how they disrespected God in the flesh. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him all night long. They showed him no respect. They put crowns of thorns on his head and pushed it in where it basically penetrated his skull, y'all. It wasn't just a set there. It went down in his skull to the extent that he was a bloody mess. Blood was everywhere. Why? Because he came, according to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, amen, to bring us salvation. Mm -hmm. When is the lamb to the slaughter? As I read to you in Isaiah 53 and 7, Jesus Christ was that lamb. He was that Pascal lamb. He was that burnt offering. He was that peace offering. Let me stop, peace offering. He was that trespass offering. He was that meat offering. Come on. He was that sin offering. All of it pointed to Jesus Christ, the ultimate lamb of God. Way of escape number two. Oh, Lord, at 205. Let me add one thing. I'm going to Don't violate your conscience. Uh-oh. I'm going to read this one scripture that's going to get real, real deep. Let me, get, let, me, let me just wet your tongue a little bit on this. Let's go to Romans, the 14th chapter. All right. 14th chapter, verse number 23. Notice what it says here. And he that that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Don't violate your conscience. And I'm going to leave it at that, and we'll pick this up, amen, concerning certain things, all right? I want you to concentrate on the word called prick, because one's heart has to be pricked, amen, to understand that for me to have received the consciousness to even know that I had a need for God. God had to do something. It was so agitating. When the loins of my mind, he had to shake me up. He had to shake you up in order for us to understand that God most definitely was doing a work in our lives. All right? So sometimes we got to be pricked. All right? And the Bible, okay, the Bible asks Paul, why do you most definitely, what do you say? Why do you continue to come against the prick? Um, let it be known. Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Why are you kicking against the prick? All right. Why are you trying to kick against anything that I've established concerning the New Testament and all that I'm about to establish and doing a new work in the people of God? And so that was so beautiful. God bless you. Um, man, I enjoy teaching that series for part five. We got more to go. More to go. Hopefully we go a little deeper in it. God bless you. Let me do this and unshare my screen. And maybe, just maybe, 
It's someone here that has a question. We still got uh, several people sitting online. Thank the Lord. I'm glad to hear that. God bless you. Uh, he was out all in all. That's right. He was out all in all. That's right, Evangelist Dyer. Uh, we'll say amen to that. Any questions? Unmute your mic, please. 207, we got a little more time. Any questions? Type it in or either unmute your mic. Could you do that for Pastor Falk, please? Please. Any questions? Was it that good or you just don't feel like talking today? Okay. Well, thank the Lord. I pray that you enjoy part number five of this glorious, glorious, um, okay, here we go. Pastor, they were not of us. Is that referencing the backslider of those who completely departed from the faith like reprobates? Well, daughter, that's a good question. But bottom line is, based in regards to the full plan of God, as it pertains to when he makes up his jewel. He's basically saying that these individuals, based on God's preeminence and God's omniscience, they was not of us. Why? Because understand the greatest thing in this walk is not that um, um, we walk in the doctrine of election. The greatest thing is, is man must perpetually choose, I reiterate, he must perpetually choose to follow God. He must perpetually choose to serve God. So the Apostle John comes and said it very clearly. If they was of us, they would still most every want to continue to choose the ways in which God is most ever required to stay in him. Notice the Bible says in the 15th chapter of John's daughter, he says, I am the true vine. He said, amen, you must abide in me. And once you stop abiding in me, amen, and think you can go off on your own through strange doctrine and what have you and leave the fold in which I have called you to be in. John has said if they was of us, they would still most of still be with us. Us meaning them and the body of Christ and also the things required to remain in the faith. So it's obvious they made a decision not to be with us. And so understand God himself is not going to stop anybody who does not want to serve him. Now God has grace. God always has what I consider a voice is always crying out to the backslider. A lot of time when we read the scripture, he's married to the backslider. No, he wasn't talking about just in regards to somebody going backslider. He's talking about Israel as a nation because he put Israel off temporarily as a for a bill of divorce. Now understand, Israel is God's earthly people. We're not God's earthly people. We're God's heavenly people. And Abraham let it be known when God looked up and said the star seed. But also the Jews, who most definitely, who come through the body of Christ, they're sand seed and star seed. Understand what I'm saying? And because of these things, it is imperative that the Bible says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. It all goes back to choice. Adam had the ability to choose whether he wanted to partake of the fruit or not. People always sit back and forget about choice. So if they was of us, they would still be with us because they would choose to be with us. But since they chose not to, they was never of us because guess what? Their hearts and their minds were not settled in staying in God. Amen. Glory be to God. Does that make sense, daughter? If it is, unmute your mic or type something in. God bless you. Will that suffice? Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Good question. I love good questions. And if I can't answer that, I'm not going to fake it until I make it. I'll say, let me get back to you. Okay. I see some more. Yes. I, I'm trying to understand. Excuse me. I'm trying to understand. Don't violate your conscience. Well, to violate your well, violate your conscience means the consciousness in which God has given you. Okay, I can always the consciousness of your godly conscience. If I violate my godly conscience, what am I doing? I'm going against the things in which my conscience, through the power of the Holy Ghost, is leading me. Conscience means what I call the abstract things of the mental aspects of God. All right. That's what the Bible said, let this mind be in you. It was also in Christ Jesus. The mind deals with the consciousness of God. Understand, daughter? So if I violate, if I violate that conscious, what would I do? I will go most definitely and find myself appertaining to the natural man's conscious. Okay, which entails the things the Bible says that the old man, the natural man, can nor would he ever ever be. 
for what? Their foolishness unto him. It cannot discern it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Well, thank you for those good questions. I thank you for those two questions. Thank you. I love when you have a question because somebody was already thinking it, but they was afraid to say some or type it in. There's no need. We're not trying to embarrass nobody. The Bible said all that getting, let's get some understanding around here. And I'm telling you right now, there's so much false doctrine out here. And when I find people most definitely uh, running to it, it's obvious they most definitely have not taken time to make sure they were rooted and grounded in truth. But thank God I can sit back and say that is not named among many of you that I have most definitely the pleasure of pastoring. God bless all of you. I pray that I'll see many of you around Lord's will in the altar tonight. The Bible says man need always pray that he may not faint. I'm no different from you or anybody else. I most definitely must keep under myself um, the things that are required that I may find myself walking diligently in the things of God. Until next time, Lord's willing, tomorrow we most definitely will come before you at 715, if the Lord says so, with a new Bible series. We completed it last week. Amen. Um, are you boasting in the true church? Do you have something to boast about in the true church? That was a good series. We did five parts of that, but tomorrow, Lord's willing, we're coming with a brand new series. You pray well for us um, as God allows us to complete and do what's deemed necessary. God bless you. We most definitely thank and praise the Lord for all you. And shalom, and God be with you as he is with me. Love all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you for viewing MTTV via Voxcast, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and our Mountaintop website. We pray that these Bible series have been a blessing to you. For our objective is to be able to enhance your spiritual man, that you would be avail the opportunity to grow thereby in Christ Jesus and to encourage you to sustain what you've learned thus far. God bless you, heaven smile upon you, and try to have a Jesus day.